this topic we're talking about perturbations and structured uncertainty. <clears throat> so we've talked about perturbations a little bit, matrix perturbations. Again, the reason we're talking about these is because later on we're going to talk about systems, and those systems are going to involve matrices that are perhaps uncertain. And so we're going to want to figure out, for example, if we have some uncertainty in our system, how, uh, how does that affect, for example, stability of the system and, and things like that. So suppose now we have a matrix A, the full column rank, we've seen this problem already, and we're looking for delta such that A plus delta is no longer full rank, we're looking for the smallest one, we saw that the answer to this question um, <clears throat> is, is actually manifold, but a, the, a delta that invol is involved in the proof is a dyad of this form. Okay, So this has um, matrix norm sigma n. Uh, it is the smallest singular value of a. So we saw this problem if we consider the two norm of the system. The same approach holds if we use the F norm of the system. So we talked about the Frobenius norm last time. Suppose now that A has rank less than full. What is the smallest perturbation that makes it full rank? So it's kind of the opposite problem. Here are some other problems. Given a square matrix A and a perturbation delta, how close are the eigenvalues of A plus delta to those of A? So, so this is a little bit different problem. This is an eigenvalue problem. Or how about this one? Given the matrix A and perturbation delta, how close are the singular values of A plus delta to those of A? So these are some related questions. Also, we could look at it from the multiplicative uncertainty. What is the smallest delta such that this determinant is 0? We saw this already. Um, for if delta, again, is small enough, the determinant will be non-zero. And we saw that a dyad can also be used here of this form. And this has norm 1 over sigma 1. And uh, so again, this was shown for the 2 norm. It also holds for the Frobenius norm. The small gain theorem says that the matrix I minus A delta is non-singular when delta is sufficiently small, in particular if the norm of delta is less than 1 over the norm of A, or it, if this is true, this, this product is true. So this is often referred to as the small gain theorem, and we're going to come back later and see this same kind of approach applies to systems. Now, one of the things that is often used in terms of um, uh, an, um, an assessment for a matrix in terms of its invertibility is something called a condition number. So the condition number is defined to be the largest singular value of the matrix divided by the smallest singular value of the matrix. So we will always have that the condition number is greater than or equal to 1 because the larger is always greater than the smaller. The condition number of the matrix is equal to the condition number of the inverse. Okay, The inverse, if the inverse exists. The condition number of a product is less than or equal to the product of the condition numbers. If we uh, multiply the matrix by a unitary matrix, that we, ha we preserve the condition numbers. And if we have A adjoint times A, the condition number of that is actually equal to the condition number of A quantity squared. So the condition number basically gives a bound on the relative change in A inverse due to a perturbation of A. So that's, that's related to our perturbation problems. So we also saw again this theorem that for the multiplicative uncertainty, we have 1 over sigma a, the largest singular value, and we have this dyad. So this is a specific delta. And and I mean, this is, this is in a sense an arbitrary delta. If you looked at this delta, it would in general be a full matrix. Um, and so the, if, if you're allowed to have any delta, for which we want this minimization to occur, then, then this kind of delta can, can work. But what happens if the delta has structure? For example, what if it has zeros in particular places? So in general, this will not have zeros in those particular places. So the question is, how does this change the problem? And so this is important for us because of the fact that often when we have uncertainty, the uncertainty doesn't appear just anywhere 
in the in the system or in the problem it appears in specific places and so we want to know what happens in that case so in the previous results we assume the perturbation could be any matrix of compatible dimensions and and so the dyad certainly followed that um, again we also assume that the matrix is complex what happens if it's real um, we also assume that the matrix was full in the sense that any element could be non-zero so the idea of structure of matrix is really related again to the placement of zeros and so how do the previous problems change if if the uncertain elements uh, if there are certain elements in the perturbation matrix that must be zero. In general, the structure of the perturbation depends on the problem that you're looking at. In the case where we seek the smallest uncertainty to make I minus A delta singular, what if instead we want I minus A to be non-singular? Or perhaps we have two uncertainties, I minus delta 1 times A times delta 2. What if we want this to be non-singular? How would we approach that problem? So we can actually use the property that the determinant of I minus the product AB is equal to the determinant I minus the product BA. So even though AB and BA do not commute, and in fact, the product AB might, this will have to be square, otherwise you can't subtract, but the product of AB may be even a different size than the product BA. So we will use this property in, in evaluating the structured perturbations. So next we're going to move on to talk about the structured singular value.